Um, I want to update you. We're a family here. And if, if you haven't been here long enough to figure that out, or, or if you've been here long enough to know, we, we're a family here. We're a church family. Um, and um, a couple of our members uh, are facing some, um, some physical battles. Um, Steve Caldwell will be going up to Emory. They, he, was, he got a x-ray or something done and and he's been dealing with one spot of cancer back on his hip and they found just a couple they found a couple I think just a couple they found a couple of spots on his lung and so he literally in a week I mean he's going up tomorrow morning to start a week of uh, intensive chemotherapy um, on those spots um, and they put off the treatment that they were going to do at the end of the month for right now back on his hip um, and so be praying for him and for Joy and for Carly and Miss Marcia um, has found out she has she's been on the prayer list she has some uh, throat and stomach cancer and she's going up to Emory tomorrow uh, for her first um, appointment Tuesday. Tuesday for her that's right for her first appointment on Tuesday and uh, so I just ask you to, to keep those two lifted up um, especially this week um, doctors and nurses and all that will care for both of them um, that you would just uh, continue to lift them up in prayer um, I don't know about you um, but uh, growing up there were lots of things I thought I wanted to be when I grew up and um, I, I, for most of my life, I, I wanted to grow up and be a major league baseball player. Now, I'm sure nobody in here has ever had that dream, right? Um, but I really did. And I really kept that dream alive uh, because I was... Whoops! I was usually a pretty good baseball player in my age bracket and that kind of stuff. And when I started playing for my school, I was, you know, one of the better players or whatever. And I really saw, kept that dream alive until I realized there were no scouts from college or Major League Baseball coming to watch me play. Um, in fact, there was a guy on our team who was better than I was, and they weren't coming to watch him play. And so about my junior year, I figured I better reassess what I want to do with my life. And so for a while, I thought, well, I'll go work for ESP. In. Uh, it had just sort of broken the, the thing, and I thought, well, I could be the better version of Chris Berman, and uh, until I realized I, I hated my English class, and I didn't like writing anything, uh, my penmanship was horrible, um, and I started looking into going to UNC Chapel Hill because they had a great journalism department and realized I didn't have the grades or the money to go there. And, and so that sort of, that dream sort of died there. And then my mom gave me some great insight when I graduated high school. She said, you can either go to college, you can join the military, or you can get a full-time job. You're not going to lay around the house. That, that was her uh, encouraging words to me. I guess she knew I would lay around the house. And so she was like, you're going to do one of these three things. Uh, I went. Uh, I, 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 start, I tried college. That didn't go well the first time. I actually went and talked to some military recruiters, had taken the test and all that kind of stuff. And then I realized, uh, I realized that the guy that was being real nice to me right then was going to be a real pain in my behind when I said yes and signed the papers and so I sort of got scared off from that so I went and for a couple of years I just worked a bunch of sort of what I call dead-end jobs they weren't what I wanted to be as a career they were jobs they made money um, wasn't really any fulfillment in that and that kind of stuff and then I and, and I said I want to go make real money and I found out what real money was and I found out how much of my real money the government took before I ever got my check and so, consequently, I ended up back in college with a new attitude, a new perspective, a uh, new goal, new drive, new desire, and, and, and did well the second time, but it took some of that incentive. And now I'm 49 years old, uh, been married for 27 years, uh, have two adult children by the legal uh, <laughs> definition, uh, have two adult children, um, and I'm the pastor for 10 years of this great congregation of believers 
And you guys really are a great congregation of believers. Uh, it's awesome to see the love and the care that that we all have for one another. I have no doubt that you're going to be praying for Mr. Steve and Miss Marcia this week. Because um, I just believe that's the kind of church that we are. But all of our hopes and dreams, and then I'm sure you had something similar to that. Maybe you're lucky enough today to do exactly, you know, when you were a kid, what you thought you wanted to do. I do know two people um, that I'm acquainted with that from the time they were a real little kid wanted to be a fireman. And today they're firemen. And so that has been their dream all the way up through. And today they are. And so they're living the dream. And, and maybe you've had some similar to that. Maybe what you're doing today or the fulfillment you found in what you're doing today, uh, you never even thought of when you were younger and those kinds of things. And so I'm sure you're sort of like me in that regard. And so regardless of whether it's our careers or our families or our, our goals in life or even our spiritual life, uh, they are our what ifs. We're doing this series called If, and they are our what ifs. Uh, a what if is, is sort of a dream. Like, for instance, Thomas Edison said, what if we could develop a light bulb that we could put in different parts of the house instead of lighting a candle and having to carry it through and, and trying to read at night by candlelight? What if we could develop a light bulb and a lighting system? He was also the person who said, uh, when, he, when an experiment would go wrong, he said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that it won't work. Henry Ford said, what if we could develop a motorized vehicle that would allow people to get around easier than walking to the store or horse and buggy? He was also the one who soon after that said, what if we could make 10 a day instead of one every 10 weeks? Instead of putting it together by hand, what if we could mechanize it? He also is famous for saying, if you think you can do a thing or think you can't do a thing, you're right. JFK said, what if we could be the first country to put a man on the moon? And in fact, he guaranteed that we would be the first country to put a man on the moon. In fact, every episode of Shark Tank that you have ever watched is nothing more than a bunch of what ifs. Somebody said, what if, and they developed something. Maybe, what if I could take two years and develop the best pillow you could ever sleep on? And he did, and it's called My Pillow. Now, I saw the who, I, I was wondering who, who's been married the least. Who, who, anybody here been married less than five years? Okay, two years, one year, okay. Now, Violet, I don't know if they had this when, when, when you, you guys got married. If not, you're going to wish you would have known about this. It's called the Bridal Buddy. In fact, next bar bridal shower you go to, you need to go buy the Bridal Buddy. You know what it is? It's something that helps a lady go to the restroom after she has put her wedding dress on. So it's just sort of this thing, it slides up, and it pulls your whole dress up to here, and then you can do your business, and then you drop it down, and, and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't experience that, maybe Monica did or whatever. So remember, next bridal shower, they should get several bridal buddies, that's what you're looking for. And then the icy, breezy air conditioner and cooler, that was on Shark Tank, one of their ideas. Now you, you saw this idea originate on Facebook with a $2 cheap styrofoam cooler. You put a little fan in there, you put ice in the thing, and, and it would take the cool air of the ice and blow it out like an air. Well, somebody patented it. Now the cooler's real nice. You have a little handle. You can pull it with you. It, you can put your drinks in there. It can cool them while it's cooling you, but it is actually a real thing. Um, from what was just a sketch, so to speak, on Facebook is now a real item that you can buy. All of those things and every other thing you've ever seen on Shark Tank is nothing more than a what if. Those are all great ideas. But some people have had some what ifs that were a little bit bigger, I believe. Martin Luther King said, what if people of all colors could live, work, and worship in the same place in harmony? I think that's a little bit bigger what if. In fact, he would set it in a way he had a dream, right? Mother Teresa said, what if we could treat the dirtiest, sickest, most diseased people of Calcutta with love, charity, and dignity. You see, if you ever get a chance to read a biography or, or, or autobiography or whatever, Mother Teresa, you need to do so because she knew in her ministry she was never going to physically heal anybody. 
The people she dealt with had AIDS early in the, you know, way back when it was first developing. There was no medicine to take. There was no solution to it. And they would take the dirtiest and the most diseased people in to her place and to her, her, her place. And, and they would, all, their whole goal was to treat them with love and to help them die with dignity. That's a little bit bigger what if. Blake McCoskey, maybe you guys have heard of him. He said, what if we could put shoes on people, or especially children, in poor countries? And thus, Tom's shoes were born. How many of you have a pair of Tom's shoes? A few of you. That's that. It wasn't so I can make some money. It wasn't I have a great idea. It was so I could help put shoes on poor keep people. There was a, uh, Some people had a what if. What if we could find and provide clean drinking water for people in all the different tribes of Africa, out in the bush and all of those things. And today there's several organizations who go out and drill wells and put in fil uh, filtration systems and help provide clean water where people were dying every day simply because of the diseased water that they had to drink. And they do that on the basis of donations from people that they never see, from people that they never talk to. It's a what if. Somebody said, what if we could do this? In fact, today you are sitting in a bona fide what if. There was a group of people that over 10 years ago got together and said, what if we create a church that what you wore, where you lived, what you did, and where you were on your spiritual journey did not DQ you from being a part of it? And that's what we've sought for 10 years to create is that place. And so you're sitting here simply because it was a dream at one point. Now, every dream is created twice. Every dream is created twice. It's created once in the mind, and it's created once in the physical. Once in the mind, we, 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 we think of those things. We dream about the possibilities, and then we put our hands and our feet to them, and we explore the possibilities. The medical clinic that we do is a great example of that. Uh, sometimes in our minds we, we dream up the experiments and then with our hands and, our, and, and all that we engineer the experiments and true to form sometimes the experiments blow up in our face but we're trying nonetheless. In our minds we see the problem and, in our, and then with our hands we try to solve the problem. In our minds, we, we see an injustice, we see a need, we, we see a, 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 a hurt or a, a pain there, and, and with our hands, we go to provide justice and, and hand those things out. Every dream is created twice, once in the physical, once in the mental. And can I tell you today that you are God's what if. You are God's what if. You say, what do you mean by that, Rick? Well, God thought of you long before he created you. God thought of you in his mind. He had your day set in his mind long before the biological act took place that brought you together. In Psalm 139, it says this. It says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you, make, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. When I was reading that this week, I just thought a snap should go there, right? Uh, your, your, your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Get this, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. You are God's what if. You are his creation. And he has thought of you, and he has loved you long before you were created. Long before you came out of the womb, and long before you took your first breath, and long before uh, you worried about going to the bathroom, not going to the bathroom. You worried about coming your hair, not coming your hair. You worried about showering, not showering. Long before all that, God thought of you. God knew you. God dreamed of you, and then he created you. Ephesians 2 and chapter 10 says, For you are God's masterpiece. Do you realize that God holds you higher than the rest of his creation? Is he impressed with his creation of all the variety of birds? Sure, the creativity of colors, flight patterns, wing sets, all of that. Is he impressed with his creativity in that? Yes, but he holds you higher 
that that is he impressed with all the fish of the sea and all the different colors and styles and predators and non-predators and what they eat and how they live and how they breathe and how they swim. Yes, but he holds you higher than all of that. Maybe you've heard the phrase, God don't make no junk. And I had this thought this week as I was preparing for this message. I run into a lot of people that have a self-image problem. Now, some people have a self-image problem where they think just a little too much of themselves, right? I mean, it's arrogance and boastful and those kinds of things. But there's a lot of people who have a self-image problem that, that is bad. I mean, it, they, 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 they fret about how they look, of am I thin enough or not, or what, what, how do I dress, what, what clothes do I wear, what am I driving, where do I live, who do I hang out with, who can I impress, who can I not impress? And I had this thought this week that, that when we, we worry about our self-image and we worry about those things like my lack of hair and, and those kinds of things, we're, we're actually insulting God when we do that. We're questioning the work of our master. You are God's what if. You are his creation. Let me ask you this question. If you are God's what if, then what is your what if? If you are God's what if, then what is your what if? What is your God idea? You see, there's a difference in a good idea and a God idea. Tacos for lunch is a good idea. <laughs> Feeding the homeless is a God idea. Uh, running a 5K is a good idea. But what if we run a 5K with a purpose and a plan to raise, maybe raise money for a mission or a ministry? That's a God idea. And by the way, for those of you that are in our Run for God group, I've had that thought this week. And so I really want us to look at that as we get towards our race in December uh, of trying to use it to raise money for a ministry or a mission. You see, a God idea is one that is sparked in your mind. And quite honestly, God never lets go. For two years, every night when I would, I would have this same dream, for two years, and the dream was always the same, and it involved me standing up on, in some sort of platform or in some sort of room speaking to teenagers. For two years, long before the first day of I ever went and talked to the pastor, before the first time I ever went and talked to the youth pastor, I went and helped the youth pastor, for two years I had the same dream over and over and over and over of working with teenagers. Eventually, God called me into that. In fact, when I went to talk to my pastor about it, he even said, he goes, I'm not exactly sure what your dream means, but why don't you go work with our youth in the church? And the first time I was in there, I knew this is what God was calling me to do. This church was in my mind. I had, I had visited several churches. I had seen some different things happening in church world and church life. And this church was even in my mind months before. I even told Monica about it. Months before I even really knew God would call us to do it. You are God's what if, so what is your what if? Mark Batterson says that every what if has what's called a Genesis moment. A Genesis moment. That moment when you see a need, or you see an injustice, or you see an opportunity, and it sparks in you an imagination. It sparks in you a creativity. It sparks in you a drive and dreams. There's been several times, I can just tell you, in the last 10 years where I've gone through periods of not even being able to sleep at night because I saw something and God was sparking something. I couldn't even go to bed. Monica would get up in the middle of the night and, and walk out and see me sitting there, sometimes looking you know, on my iPad and scanning different things and writing things down. She's like, what's up with you? It's that Genesis moment when God sparks something in you and he just doesn't let it go. I want to give you a, a couple of quick points here about how you can recognize your God ideas versus your good ideas. The first thing is it doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from you. It, it comes from God. It, it, it's, a, it's something where you see an injustice. You see a need. You see an opportunity. You see kids dying in the street, in the, in the wood or the, the dirt streets of Africa, all because of diseased water. You see kids that take water bottles and they crush them down and tie string to make shoes. You, you go and you see people who have been um, lured into human trafficking and those kinds of things. It's a dream that doesn't 
begin with you. And I will say this. Many times it does come from a dream. I do believe God speaks to us in dreams, but I want to caution us. I also believe that at times Satan tries to speak to us in dreams. And so one of the times when maybe God's speaking to you or you're trying to ascertain, is this God or is it me? Is it God or is it even Satan trying to lure me away into something? You need to make sure, does it measure up with God's Word? Does it measure up with what God says in His Word? If you came to me and said, you know, God gave me a dream last night. I should have five wives. I'm just going to tell you, you're wrong. You can't find five women who would want you. But, but it would be wrong. Why? Because it doesn't measure up to what God's Word says. So it doesn't come from you. It may come through a dream. It may come through a thought that you have. You literally see something and a thought sparks in your mind. Some of you are very artistic and creative. It may even come from a doodle on a piece of paper. You know, I've seen um, people when, I, when you were in high school, you would see girls who would always write. They'd be dating some guy and they'd write their name as if they were married, right? You saw that? And then they'd do all sorts of flowers around it and all that. Nobody was ever writing my name. But, but I mean, you may be creative and you start doodling on a piece of paper and something's really on your mind. And next thing you know, what you see come out on this paper is this idea. Not only that, but the idea is beyond your ability. In fact, I will tell you, if you can think of something and you can think of everything to do to make it happen, that may be a very good idea, not a God idea. You say, well, how, why do you say that? Because God wants to get you beyond your ability. Because when He gets you beyond your ability, that's when His ability kicks in. When He gets you beyond your comfort zone, that's when He comes in. That's when He can get the glory for what's being done and what's happening. Not, not if I could see something and just think of a way to solve that problem right away. No. But it, it, it'll be an idea that is beyond your ability. And then here's the third way to, 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 to recognize God ideas. It will personally cost you. God ideas are not money-making schemes. So what do you mean by that? Hey, you may see an idea and think of a way, but then you begin to think of how could I capitalize off of this? How could I make money off of this? How could I get people to pay for this? A God idea will cost you personally. It will cost you time. It will cost you energy. It will even cost you your very own money. Right, Miss Cindy? People don't know this, and I don't publicize it, but a lot of times when people come and talk to me about an idea, an idea that they have, that's sort of what I'm listening for. Because I've had people come and go, wouldn't it be great if the church could do blah, 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 blah? And I say, yeah, are you going to head that up? No, I'm not going to head it up. I just thought it would be a great idea if we find some people and they could do this. Well, what about if, what about if the church could go uh, deliver food to all the, the elderly families in the area? Are you going to help with that? No, I'm real busy at what I do. I just thought it would be a great idea. Are you going to pay for it? No, I'm not going to pay for it. I'm broke. But I just thought it would be a great idea. When it's a God idea, it literally will be something that will cost you time, it will cost you energy, it will cost you, like the old phrase goes, blood, sweat, and tears, and it will cost you your own, some of your own money. And many of you are in here and you're part of a God idea right now. Some of you are sitting in a building that is part of a God idea right now. So what is God's, God, you are God's what if, what is your what if? What's your God idea? What is it? And I, and I imagine for some of you that you're sitting here right now, you're saying, you know what? I did have a passing thought, but I just sort of let it go. But maybe God was trying to speak to me about something. Maybe God really was trying to call me to do something. And maybe it scared me, and so I, I sort of sloughed it off or just tried to ignore it. But God won't let it go. I look around the room and I, and I realize many things that you guys are in. I know Celebrate Recovery and the Rock Ministry and, and, and Mr. Clower and for years has been involved in ministry. Full of God ideas. But I will say this, God ideas without actions die. God's ideas without actions die. Let me ask you some questions. What makes you cry? 
Now, I'm not talking about Hallmark movie. In fact, I did hear this week that there's 42 or 47 new Hallmark movies coming out for Christmas. So, guys, go ahead and mark on your DVR the things you want to keep because there's going to be a lot of stuff erased for those Hallmark movies. But what is it that makes you cry? Maybe it's the fact that I know many of you are, are teachers, and maybe it's the fact that you see a kid leave your classroom on Friday and you realize how hungry he's going to be all weekend. Maybe that makes you cry. Maybe it's the idea of homeless families. Many of you have met the families that we host when we host Family Promise. And you come in and you, you talk to them, and many of them will share their stories openly. Maybe that breaks your heart. Maybe it's seeing the, the 14, 16, 18, 20-year-old who's been lured away. I was watching an a expose or a, a documentary type of thing on human trafficking not long ago. And one person said, I just went and met this person. We're sitting at McDonald's. They bought me a meal, and I was drinking my Coke. And the next thing I knew, I woke up in a different country. They didn't wake up in Macon. They woke up in a different state. And some of them in a different country to where they really would have no orientation and no idea of where they were at or how they could get help or how they could get out. And the next thing they knew, they were prostituting for this pimp. Maybe it's those that, that in our, live in our, in our area that have no medical care. You know, we have a lot of people that we see in our medical clinic, and some of them we've seen for many, many years. And some of them simply come for simple issues that we see as simple, but, but for them they don't have a doctor. They don't have money to, to go see a doctor and insurance to cover the things that they need. Maybe that's what breaks your heart. You see, God has not called us to live in isolation in our ivory towers that we call home and just bank our money so that we can retire. Don't worry. God has a way of retiring you when he's done with you. He'll take care of retiring you when he's ready. But let me ask you, what makes you cry? What makes you righteously angry? Now, righteous is the key word. I'm not talking about the person that cuts you off in traffic, jumps in front of you at Walmart. I'm not talking about what makes you angry. I'm talking about what makes you righteously angry. You know, the scripture said that one of our responsibilities is to care for widows and orphans. So when we look out and we see widows or orphans, that should make us righteously angry. When we see widows that are not being cared for, that should make us righteously angry. Something is we should undertake. What makes you wish that you could quit your job today and start doing it tomorrow? What, what is it that you wish you could stop doing today? I, 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 had some, I had this out for about a month, and someone told me I wasn't real clear that you were supposed to write on it. And I just thought the writing and the pen laying on it would have said write on it. But obviously I did a bad, a bad job with that. But it says, if I knew I couldn't fail, I would. And I wanted people to fill in things. And though there aren't many things on here, there are some that are very interesting. Uh, one would say, one person said they would go back to school. If they knew they couldn't fail, they would go back to school. One person, real ambitious, I want to meet this person, run for president. Run for president. Some person said they would help people if they knew they couldn't fail. Some put go skydiving or go to Mars. Some have said have a women's Christian shelter. Someone else put write a women's devotional series. If you knew you couldn't fail, these are the things that make you cry. These are the things that stick with you. These are the things where God sparks in your mind, and depending on how you rely, respond to it or not, how it takes form and how it takes shape. Maybe you're a teacher who says, you know what, I'm a teacher five days a week, but I really wish I could start a tutoring ministry for underprivileged kids. Maybe underprivileged kids here, or maybe even helping with an organization where they, where they tutor kids abroad. Maybe you're a businessman who says, I wish I could start a scholarship fund for preacher's kids who are going to college. Hit me up. <laughs> Maybe it's an empty nest mom and dad who say, I want to go and give time to some kids who don't have parents. Maybe their parents are in prison, or maybe their parents are dead, or, or, or just out of their lives, but there's kids who don't have parents. See, you can shed all the tears and pray all the prayers, but when God gives you a God idea, He calls you to action. You've heard the phrase, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? 
And I don't know where that came from or who wrote it or who penned it or whatever, but I think it's a very relevant question for us as we're in this if series. What if? I believe in this room there's, there's great intelligence, there's great creativity, there's great imagination in this room. And I believe that God's desire would be to speak to each of us and say, what if? What if you could reach those people in my name? What if you could reach out to those people in my name? What if you could just give it to me and surrender to me the thing I've been bugging you about for years? What if? Let me go back to Psalm 139. We read verses 13 to 16 earlier, but listen to what verse 17 and 18 says. It says, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. Do you realize that God has these thoughts about you? It says, I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. What's your what if? What's your God idea? What is it that God has spoken to you and sparked in your mind? You see, you're not alone. The reason you can write something on there that if you want to fail, because if God is with you, what does Romans 8.31 says? We seem to always come circle around to this every week. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? So when you have that God idea and you have that spark in your mind and God speaks to your heart, do not fear and do not fret. Is it bigger than you? I hope so. Is it going to cost you some of your time, effort, and energy? I hope so. But never fret. You are not alone because God is for us. Now I want to use an illustration, not, not in an effort to make people mad, but it's very relevant this week. What if the 535,000 people who went to the fair last year at about average 10 bucks a head to get in, $5.3 million, what if all those people, myself included, I was one of those 535,000 people, what if we took that 10 bucks? And we put it towards our God ideas. Hey, if we could, if we could have done that, five point three million dollars. Hey, we could buy all the coat. We could buy coats for everybody in Ukraine. Five point three million dollars. We could, we could, um, we could uh, house the homeless women. We could feed homeless families in Macon. We could rebuild Florida, Texas, Puerto Rico, or right? all that sort of an exaggeration. But you get my point. What if? What if? What is it that God is speaking to your heart about? What is it that maybe for years you've run from? Because you just said, there's no way I could do it. Great, you're right where God wants you to be. What if? As we do this series, and many of you are in life groups, and you're going through the small group curriculum. What if? At the end of this series, what if God has burned in your heart, spoken to you over these last several weeks? What if God gives you a God idea and instead of putting it aside for fret, fretting and fearing about it, you said yes and surrendered it to God? The song we're getting ready to sing says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Can I tell you today that when Jesus is yours, you have no reason to fret. You have no reason to fear. Now, if Jesus is not yours today, and you're here today, as Tucker even prayed, we're glad that you're here. We're excited that you're going to worship with us today. But there is reason for you to fret, and there is reason for you to fear. Because there is an eternity. There is a judgment that comes to all of us. But if you're here today... you know Christ it doesn't matter what comes your way it doesn't matter what God calls you to there is no reason for you to fret or to fear let's pray